It's really very good of you to, uh, to join us at the Trade Tech Conference in Paris. It's um, especially given the, uh, you know, the noise and brouhaha that's uh, you know, surrounding AEX and the Michael Lewis book. But uh, it's also very good of you to join us and agree to speak in French. So excellent. Let's proceed. I stayed up all night working on it. <laughs> We're told your language is, is particularly rich from time to time. So uh, perhaps you could do those bits in a... <laughs> <laughs> in French. I don't know who's in the room, but some might fly. <laughs> can everyone hear Ronan, by the way? You, you can, okay. So maybe, I, I don't know, I suspect we might need a little bit more volume. volume. So, so Ronan, thanks very much, and we'll, uh, we'll try and get through these. Now, um, you know, what, what I said to your, your guys yesterday, there's, uh, as you well know, as Europeans, you know, we're not going to get caught up in all this U US noise and passion and heat and everything. We're going to take a much more cultured uh, approach to um, the issues that, that are raised in Michael Lewis's book. And obviously, I'm not going to question you about Michael Lewis's book because you guys didn't write it. You, you just happened to feature in it. Um, but the, the first question I think we've got to get through is, is really, you know, look, be frank, what was IEX involved in the production of this book, whether it was uh, funding it uh, or writing it or checking quotes or picking the picture on the front cover or, you know, whatever. How, w were you guys in involved in it, constructing it? Yeah, we, we were not involved in constructing it at all. Uh, obviously, we were involved in it to the extent that we talked to Michael Lewis quite a bit. Um, uh, we don't have that kind of funding to pay Michael Lewis to write a book, to be honest. Uh, just to give you some quick background on, on what occurred, uh, Brad, our CEO, and I had met him a little over a year ago as background on a, a story he was writing on Sir Galenikov, the uh, Goldman programmer who went to jail. Can, can, can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. I can anyway. Great. Okay. Great. So uh, we, we had gone out to dinner with Michael, and uh, you know, during the dinner he goes, you know, in Michael fashion, he's like, what is it that you guys are doing? And we kind of explained it at the time. He came by our office. Um, came by several times, and it wasn't until the summer that he said, guys, I think there's an article in this. And by an article, as a startup, we thought he was going to put something in Vanity Fair. We're like, that's fantastic. And then during the fall, he says, I'm putting a book together on this. And he neglected to tell us to the extent that we were involved in it. But in and around the Christmas time, he said, I'm going to tell the story through the eyes of Brad. I've gone out and I've interviewed hundreds of people on the sell side, the buy side, high frequency, regulators, former regulators. But he says, I think it makes sense in the timeline to tell it through Brad's eyes. So I'm like, that's great. Maybe I won't have the exposure that I since got. And um, a couple of days before the book came out, we saw the table of contents. And both Brad and I had a chapter named after us. So uh, honest to God, we had no idea the extent to which we would be included in the book. Um, we're, you know, Obviously, we're, we're happy how it came out. I uh, apparently look like I survived a famine, and I'm very pale. But uh, other than that, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty happy with how things uh, turned out. Yeah, you're right. He, he wasn't very kind to you, was he, in terms of his, description, his uh, <laughs> description? We've we got some people there suggesting you're a model standing or something, some kind yeah. of actor. Well, what, what was funny is, uh, you know, I, I made a comment about, uh, you know, I grew up in Ireland, and I made a comment about it being a shithole. And uh, when, I, when I called my father a few days after the book came out, I'm like, hey, did you read the book, Dad? And he's like, yeah, I read it from the shithole. So I... Uh, I, I, I pissed off my family nicely too, so it's all good. Good, 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 good. Well, so, sort of following on from that first question then, I mean, it, you know, I haven't read the book yet because uh, I've not been on holiday and I usually read them around swimming pools after I put the Da Vinci Code down and things like that. So um, when you, uh, you know, if you do read excerpts from the book, it's pretty clear that you guys already had good traction. You, you were getting into clients, you're having senior level conversations, you had something to say that they valued, that they were very much interested in. You know, your, your business was, was starting to take off. You know, it, it, was, it was rock and roll, yeah? Um, is there a possibility you might look back in three to five years' time um, and the fact that you were carried out on this dais by sort of Michael Lewis and Goldman Sachs and others, and you might just think, you know what, we, we, we could possibly have done without that. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a fair question. I'd say, uh, you know, besides the fact that I look like a famine survivor, so far a weekend, this has been phenomenal. So we, we had good traction. There's 34 of us here. There's only a few of us who actually go out and meet with clients. So while we had, you know, a good adoption rate, we had a lot of brokers connected to us, 
in the past week and a half, we must have met with at least another 100 buy side clients that we haven't met with before. Separate to that, too, on the, uh, on the buy side, a lot of the PMs and the analysts who never really cared about market structure or cared to hear about this have asked us to come and do presentations. So brokers have set up presentations where we're clipping off 50 buy side firms at a time in presentations. So what, what I would say is so far, I mean, we're, 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 we're humble guys. It's been remarkable to be thrown into this. You know, obviously, you can't be naive enough to think that if there's a book written about you by Michael Lewis, it's not going to get attention. The attention that this has gotten, you know, the, the infamous fight on CNBC, not that that serves anybody a great purpose, but uh, I, I think so far, I don't envision regretting this. Now, five years is a long time from now. I feel like the last week was two years, but, you know, I, I, I really don't foresee us regretting it. There, there's nothing that he said in the book materially, you know, in his message that we regret him saying. Um, maybe he harpened a little bit too much, I think, on a solution that we fixed back in 2009 that virtually every broker or any broker worth their salt or any broker who's trying to help out their clients, which I believe all brokers are, uh, has already solved for. So I think there was a lot of focus on a latency arbitrage strategy. That that's the Thor algorithm, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, and, and, and I think... You know, Mike, Michael Lewis is famous, obviously, right, for taking mundane topics as much as we all in the audience and, uh, you know, love this kind of topic. The rest of the world couldn't really give a crap, to be honest. So if you can take a mundane topic like this and normalize it so that the general audience can read it, that's why I think he harpened upon that solution a bit too much. We, we've built much more, and I mean, you know, I, I think that type of strategy that Thor solved for has been pretty much arbed out of the industry already. So... That, that that would be maybe the only the only thing that I would say is uh, there's no regret. We 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 stand by what we did. The the product still works. I've I've been told it still works by clients and by high frequency firms that I've met since we've launched. But I, maybe if he could focus a little bit more on the the newer details. But it's it's a 260 some odd page book. Um, you know how much detail can he really go into? And in fairness, he's trying to tell a story along the way too. So the the way we look at it is. I kind of view the book as a lightning rod, right? And Lewis has shunned the light on something that does need the light shined on it. And it's, it's our job at IEX. And I think it's our job in the industry, you know, both sell side, buy side, you know, industry groups like the tab group and everybody to just, you know, carry that torch and take it further and really investigate what's going on. It's like we're, we're, we're not out there saying the entire market is rigged by any means. That, that, that's not what we're saying whatsoever. There are loopholes that are being taken advantage of. And I don't think anybody can question that. And I think we all just need to take a look at it and make the market a better place. Okay. Now, there's a lot of people out scouting around to make sure people who look at you in high visibility vests are not in the Limehouse link and uh, you know around Canary Wharf. But do you think the European markets are rigged? I mean, uh, I know you just said you'd like not to be associated with accusations of rigging, but Brad was on you know, CNBC, I think, and did make that statement. So, you know, accepting that as truth, have you looked at Europe? Do you think the same problems exist in Europe to the, yeah, extent, yeah, to the no, extent that you'd say they're rigged? Yeah, so I, I don't have an answer for Europe, and the, the, the God's honest truth for that is because, like I said, there's 34 of us here. We've guys from broker-dealers, exchanges, high-frequency firms, but we're solely focused right now. We're locked and loaded on U.S. equities. Um, do... I, I'm not saying that there's no issues in Europe by any means. I, I think if you sort of, if you look at what's occurred there, it's fairly similar to what's gone on in the U.S. from the proliferation of low latency networking, microwave networks, colo. But speed doesn't necessarily mean bad. We're, we're definitely pro-technology here. Like I said, I mean, you know, our, we're famous now for delaying more, uh, orders in and out of our market by 350 microseconds. It's kind of scary that that's considered slow. But, um, you know, what, what I would say is, you know, we've been approached about potentially doing something in Europe. But while the technology somewhat might be portable, we'd really have to, you know, to, to answer this question fairly, we'd probably have to hire people who know the nuances of that market better. So I, it's maybe not the answer to the question that you want, but frankly, I'd, I'd be talking shit if I was telling you that it was rigged because I don't know that. Yeah, you're not the only one who's been talking shit this morning. Don't worry, I'm, I'm one of them. <laughs> Um, uh, 
that's applause for me being honest. Um, <laughs> so, but turning to your business model, um, it, it, you know, if we you know, forgetting the book and all that. So looking yep. at your business model, um, you, as you just mentioned, similarities between Europe and US, but, but it, it, it is slightly different in the US. So you can pin a lot of what you're addressing, all, all the issues on Reg NMS, that, you know, that there's a point in market structure history where all this seemed to, to all, the, all, the, all this started. Um, and, you know, to the extent your business model as, as a cure to this particular problem, you know, if the underlying issue of if someone turns around and says, you know what, we got that wrong and fixes Reg NMS, does something about it, does your business model not disappear? Yeah, it's, it's a fair question. The, the, the thing is, and I don't think anybody in the room would agree that we want regulators to come in and make a broad stroke kind of change, right? They, what we've built here is a free market solution. We've gone and met with the regulators. They're very supportive of it because every time they make any kind of change, it's, I hate the term, but it's the unintended consequences, right? People like to bust their balls and say, oh, the SEC, they don't know what they're doing. So when we go out and we say, we take a technical approach and we're, you know, we're, we're a, I guess, a consortium here of many different industry practitioners, they're very supportive of it. So. Reg NMS, if you look at Reg NMS, and I don't know MIFID to the extent obviously you guys would, but you know, the road's paved with good intentions, right? Reg NMS and trade through protection, when you look at it at a peripheral level, it makes complete sense, complete sense. But now when you look at it from a technology standpoint and a technology standpoint from years later, you know, how could the, how could the regulators have solved for this or even thought of this? And, and you know, what, what a lot of people are missing is things like you know, the SIP versus direct feeds. Regulators say that the, any trading venue is allowed to price their market off the SIP feed. That was kind of some of the argument that was going on last week. That's very, very important, right? 2007, the SIP feed, 3,000 microseconds, 2,000 microseconds, people will argue over what the speed is. The fact that people can co-locate next to you and know the market in sub 200 microseconds knowing what the market knows the market to be, that's problematic. How can a regulator ever mandate other than doing something similar to what we're doing at IEX, we kind of call it our anti-co-location model is, we know the market, we're the fastest participant on our market. And I don't think there's any other market that can claim that. And the reason why we're the fastest is because we take in the direct feeds, but we keep everybody 350 microseconds away. The SEC, how could they come in and mandate like banning co-location? And then if you say you're gonna ban co-location, pundits will say, oh, we'll just open up a data center across the street. Opening up a data center across the street, of course, won't solve the issue. So I, I, I think what regulators need, and you know, I'll, I'll make a broad assumption here, I think what regulators probably need in Europe as well is for industry practitioners to help out instead of uh, people like to stay in the background and like throw stones at the stupid regulators. But that, that's not the way to address this. I'm just going to deposit my stones behind the back of the chair while no one's looking. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Carrying on with the, the, the theme of, of your, your business model, um, and uh, yep. you, you, may, you may not have an answer to this at all, but, but one of the things you inevitably got, get caught up in is a sort of passionate debate about the race for latency, um, high frequency trading, good or bad, you know, yada, yada, yada. Um, one of the things that um, I, we'd be interested to know here is whether you have been able to establish what the, what the net effect is you know, if HFT um, in its current form were to be removed from the market. And, and I know lots of people have got views on how many mills per clip, you yeah. know, these guys might have made three years ago versus now and their, their overall revenue coming down. But th that's kind of different because I'm, I'm asking from an institutional trading perspective. So for, I know it's difficult to define, but a typical, uh, you know, large institutional order, um, do you guys have a view? Have you ever attempted to quantify what the removal of HFT from the market would mean on, on the, uh, the cost of implementing, a, executing a, an institutional block order? Yeah, so I, 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 get, I guess how I'd, uh, how I'd like to answer that is if I could just back up slightly and give you like a quick one minute on how we've architected our network and then what I'll do is I'll approach it at, that I've gone and met with probably 12 of the largest high frequency firms in the US at least in the past couple of months and those who are connecting to us where they are and those who aren't. And I, I, I think I'll be able to draw a correlation there as to what the potential impact negative or positive would be. So essentially what we've done and people have probably read it in the book, but uh, 
what we've done is we don't allow anybody to co-locate next to us. We've put the front door to IEX in a separate building, and everybody can meet us there. So queue position starts in that other building. Yeah, you can have a latency race to get to our front door, but when we take your order, we carry it 350 microseconds into our matching engine. We match the order immediately. It's a continuous market, and we send acknowledgement back to that front door, which is another 350 microsecond delay. So like I said earlier, that allows us to price the market fairly. We know that we're always going to be faster than anybody who's trading on our market. And the earliest you'll find out that a trade occurred on IEX is a minimum of 350 microseconds after the trade occurred. Seems oversimplified. So I, I took this show on the road and what we've said from day one and you know the book, of course, and obviously the media, they like, they like to harpen upon the anti-high frequency angle. We've, we've gone to several of the largest high frequency shops. You know, Virtu is a big high frequency shop. They've been trading here since day one. We've gone and met with many others. Some are in the process of connecting. Some, frankly, won't even let me in the front door. Some, after we've met with them, have honestly looked me in the eye and said, okay, my solution won't work there. I can't game you. And they've used that term, so I'm not spreading any hysteria here. And they've asked for backdoor connectivity to our venue. So back to the answer your question, what I would say is, it's very hard to go into a room of high frequency guys and say you're good and you're bad. And what does bad even mean? Like bad, I would contend, somewhat means maybe some of it's not bad, it's just unnecessary. It's very hard to go and say, hey, you're good and you're bad. But what I think is those who will connect to IEX obviously don't care about certain ARB strategies. There's like ETF versus the underlier. There's interlisted ARB, you know, you're up to America, there's the ADR versus primary listing. There's a lot of strategies where latency is good. So, you know, I can only go on what groups like Tab Group and ITE say where they attribute 51 or 53% of U.S. volume to high-frequency trading. And let's just say they're bang on correct there. We don't, we don't think we're taking, if, if we were supremely successful and high-frequency was to go away, high-frequency is such a broad definition, I don't think we're taking anywhere near 50% out of the market. What I think we would do is maybe take more like 20% out of the market. And the impact that would have on the institutional investor, to me, I would, I would imagine the average order size would be greater, and I don't think there'll be any loss of liquidity. We're averaging about 7 billion shares a day uh, in the U.S. this year. It was like 6.3 billion last year. If this was to drop south of 5 billion, it's not going to impact the institutional investor. And the reason why I would say that is you, you have 45 ATSs in the U.S. Uh, 44 of them are owned by brokers and consortium of broker-dealers. And what's happening, and if people get to the end of the book, which I would implore them to do, is Michael does not pin this on high-frequency trading. He basically says high-frequency trading are providing technically a service in this, in, in this instance. You have broker one has 50,000 shares to buy and broker two has 50,000 shares to sell. Both of them behind closed doors when I'll meet with them will admit they don't want to send the order to each other. So you have an electronic liquidity provider, high-frequency, whatever you want to call them, bridge that gap between the two pools better than the brokers would between themselves, it, it's, it's hard to argue that, that's, that, that they're doing something bad there. What I would argue is that they're doing something unnecessary. If the brokers didn't have that broker's dilemma and were more apt to interact with each other, then there wouldn't be the need for someone to provide liquidity in less than a millisecond between two pools. And now that we've launched our venue, we, we see this in you know practical application. You will see quotes being mirrored uh, from venue to venue all day long. We'll see a string of trades on our venue and then we'll go and we'll look on the tape and you'll see a string of tapes, sorry, you'll see a, a string of the exact same trades happening on another venue within the same few milliseconds. So there they've provided the service, they've bridged two pools. But the problem is, is now instead of 50,000 shares printing in one venue, you have 50,000 in one, 50,000 in another, and now there's 100,000 on the tape. And now present of volume algos are kicking in, and instead of buying 10% of 50,000, you're buying 10% of 100,000, and that leads to things like latency arbitrage. So, again, I'm not I'm not out here pitchforking high frequency trading. There is a place for high frequency in the market that that can't be debated, but there's there's absolutely unnecessary high frequency as opposed to just calling it bad. I don't think these guys are pirates trying to steal from everybody. But to think and say that they're all doing God's work and nothing else for that is complete bullshit. Right. Mad is the word over here, by the way. Mad. Uh, mad? <laughs> mad. Men mental. <laughs> um, back to, back to um, picking up on some of the themes there and, and back to the point about your model because 
you know, it's clear from what you say that, you know, you're not accusing everyone of being pirates, you're not accusing HFT of being sort of robbers in the market. But one thing you might be accusing the market of being is negligent in its duty, because in one sense, if you were to um, require every broker to know what's happening to their orders when they send them out the door to the various markets, where they're going to get rooted, where could they get onward rooted, if you're going to require every investment manager to be diligent about how they use their brokers and to demand explanations of what's happening to their order flow and how it's getting divvied up, where it's going, where it's going and not getting filled, where it's going and getting filled, if people were fulfilling that responsibility and if people were discerning customers and users of the market, maybe there'd be no need for IEX, yeah? Yeah, I mean, look, if it's a perfect world, there'd be no need for cops either, would there? So, I, I mean, I, I guess what I would say in that regard is we're not out there saying the buy side is not doing their job. The buy side have, you know, a much tougher job than people think they have. Uh, the sell side, I'm not saying the sell side are out there trying to pilfer people either. I mean, obviously, the sell side should know where they're routing. I worked at a sell side firm and worked on the smart order router. I know exactly where we were sending it. Um, trying to stitch that data together as a buy side firm is next to impossible to do based on time stamping, based on the data that you get back, no, none of it's normalized. I mean, while we were in the fundraising process at IEX, some of the buy side firms had us sign NDAs. They gave us all the broker data. We, we, could, we, couldn't, we could not believe the disparity between the data that they're getting back. So this is, this is not a pitchfork on the, the buy side and the sell side. What I would say is, Disintermediation wouldn't necessarily come from that. I think disintermediation would come uh, should the incumbent exchanges see IEX gain market share, should regulation come down and say that you, you can't price your clients' trades, you can't, you know, your job, your obligation as a venue is to be a referee and price those trades correctly. If, if something like that was regulated and the exchanges start to adopt our model of, you know, adding a delay to co-location, Potentially, then there's this, this intermediation. For that to happen, we would obviously have to gain market share, and we would have proven our point then. And um, you know, not not that I'm in this for sheer, you know, you know, altruism, but that would be a good thing for the market. There's no debate about that. If IEX is disintermediated, then the market has gotten a lot cleaner. Okay, Ryan, thanks for that. Um, that's the end of the uh, questions that I've got for you. For you. Um, it may be very difficult, but I want to ask you, would, would you be okay if I just open questions to the floor here and pass them through to you? Is that, is that a possibility? Yeah, yeah I, I only have a, a few more minutes because i got to get to a meeting in Midtown. You but, look uh, like you need a good breakfast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I definitely do. So very, very quickly, um, yep. uh, come on, guys. This is a wonderful opportunity. Who's, who's got a question for, for Ryan? We'll make sure it's fair, yeah? Bear with us, Ryan. Thought you were calling me mate. Sorry, mate. <laughs> Hello, Ryan. Uh, What's the crack? <coughs> Hello, Ryan. My name's Marcus Hooper. Can you hear me? Yeah. Fabulous. Um, I, I've totally enjoyed what you've said, and I'm fascinated by your market and exactly what you're up to. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me better? Yeah, um, I can hear th There is something that's kind of missing here, OK, which is that for my entire career, which has been quite a long time, Everyone's trying to, be kick, you know, trying to kick the speculator out of the marketplace. Now, I've seen market makers hated by regulators. I've seen hedge funds hated by regulators. I've seen high frequency hated by regulators. Where are we going to end up? Because, you know, the politicians hate the fact that someone can actually make some money out of speculating in the marketplace, but actually, believe it or not, add liquidity. So where are we going to end up? Where do you think? Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, as ironic as my statement's going to sound. Speculation is great, because speculation inherently brings with it some risk. If you're put bringing risk into the market, then you're adding liquidity to the market. Where I don't think you're a speculator is when you're getting between two broker dark pools, for example, and no one can trade against you. You're buying 50 from one venue and trading 50 and selling 50 on another venue. There's no real speculation there. That's why you're slicing up the, other, the order so small. Maybe at some point you buy from the seller and when you go, the buyer is not there anymore. You're left holding the bag for 100 shares. But that's not true speculation. So I agree with you. Like, I mean, even when we were going around getting the funding process of IEX, 
the, well, those on the long only side who said, oh, don't involve the hedge funds. And, and you, you really have to step back and go, guys, look, we're, we're in this market together. Uh, this is not five-year-old soccer either. I mean, if, you, if you're coming to the market and you're, you know there's inherent risk in it and you're willing to put risk on the table, whether you're doing it in microseconds, nanoseconds, minutes or hours, we're supportive of all of that. Okay. Brian, um, I think we'll draw it to a close there and, and let you get off. I think Michael Lewis was wrong not only about your description, but about suggesting that you knew nothing about the markets either. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to uh, be with us this, this morning and uh, for, for not talking mad at all, but for being frank and honest in, in your answers. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.